Excellencies, distinguished delegates, participants, and dear colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on your time zone, and welcome to this session of the FAO in Geneva Agricultural Trade Talks. My name is Dominique Burgeon, and I am the director of the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva, and I will be monitoring, uh, moderating uh, today's uh, session. I would like to thank you all for taking the time to attend our webinar today. And uh, it's clear that we appreciate your support and interest in FAO's work. Before starting our event, let me share some details regarding the logistics and housekeeping for this virtual session. This webinar will be in English only with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will later be available on our website as well as all the other webinars we have had, along with the resources relevant, of course, to this session. It is scheduled to last for about uh, one hour and a half one hour 15 minutes, uh, provided, of course, our speakers keep within their time allocation. Uh, we have reserved some time towards the end of the webinar for a Q&A session. Please submit your Q&A, your, your question in the Q&A module. While posting your questions, please kindly state your name and organization or uh, institution. We will try to accommodate as many requests as possible, either in writing or orally uh, during the webinar. I also encourage the, the speakers to, to really try to respond also in writing because it provides a really an opportunity to exchange. If you have any problem or technical issue, please let us know. Uh, that's all for the, for the housekeeping uh, issues. And uh, Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues and participants, Today, we will focus on responsible sourcing with an emphasis on sustainability uh, driven trade requirements, access to market, and the challenge faced by upstream actors in agricultural supply chains. Globalization, as you know, has revolutionized business and trade in the agriculture sector. From reduced trade barriers to advances in production and logistics, agri food trade has been on the rise. While these dynamics allow for much uh, needed jobs and economic growth, they are also placing greater stress on commodity production, trade, and supply chains. Supply chain-related development impacts continue to feature in commodity production and trade, ranging from social and environmental concerns to potential, to potential threats to food security. To address these concerns, several governments have introduced legislation with a aim to mitigate the adverse environmental and social impacts of agricultural supply chains by requiring companies to establish mandatory risk-based due diligence. As a result, lead companies in agricultural supply chains are charged with ensuring that their suppliers are producing and trading within planetary boundaries. In order to continue business and trade with key import markets, upstream actors from low and middle income economies are required to demonstrate how they are managing social and environmental risk in their business operations. In this context, building capacity and awareness on sustainably driven, sustainability driven requirements can help advance opportunities for the market integration of key players, including agricultural cooperatives. In 2016, FAO and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, launched the OECD FAO Guidance for Responsible Agricultural Supply Chains, a global standard for addressing risk and development in the agricultural sector. Understanding that suppliers in different countries have different needs, capacities, and access to market and global value chains, FAO launched in 2022 a report on agricultural cooperatives, responsible sourcing, and risk-based due diligence. This report aims to help cooperatives understand what they can do to meet sustainability requirements in global trade. The report was the first focused effort to discuss such issues. With this background, this, our session today will discuss our upstream actors in the agri-food sector, uh, particularly agricultural cooperatives, small holders, farmers, and small businesses can address development challenges to meet the changing market needs of global trade, business, and sustainability. 
Before proceeding to with our session today, I would like to introduce our speakers. Uh, today we'll hear from uh, Pascal Liu, Senior Economist in the Market and Trade Division at FEO Reporter in Rome, Mr. Tomislas Ivan Ivancic, Global Advisor, Responsible Sourcing and Agricultural Supply Chain, also in the Market and Trade Division of FEO, Ms. Claire Kask Cook, Director for Policy, Advocacy and Member Mobilization at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Mr. Jose Antonio Hidalgo Molina, uh, Executive Director of the Association of Banana Exporters of Ecuador. Ms. Masha Medelbeck, Program Director, Value Chain Transformation at the Sustainable Trade Initiative. Ms. Mr. Danilo Salerno, Regional Director at the International Cooperative Alliance, ICA Americas. Ms. Catherine Lundquist, Economic Affairs Officer in the Economic Research and Statistics Division of WTO. And then uh, Ms. Marjolaine Ennis, uh, Chair of the OECD Advisory, on, uh, Advisory Group on Responsible Agricultural Supply Chain. Thank you all for agreeing to be with us today. And without further delay, I would now like to start with our first speaker, Mr. Pascal Liu, who will now talk to us about the FAO's work on responsible business conduct and OECD uh, FAO guidance for responsible uh, agricultural supply chain. As I mentioned before, please do not hesitate to post any question you may have in the Q&A module. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dominique. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where we are. I will now uh, share my screen for the presentation. Let me see if I manage to do this. Can you see the presentation? Yes, you may, however, want to put it in full screen. Yes, yes. I'm trying to do this. Okay, I think we should perfect. be able perfect. to see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so thank you very much, Dominique, for your introduction. And uh, I will now start with a presentation on responsible business conduct and agricultural supply chains, risk-based due diligence, responsible sourcing, and development. So today in this presentation, I will address uh, why there's been this now global demand for responsible business conduct and risk-based due diligence in agricultural supply chains. I will then uh, mention and explain what is the OECD FL guidance for responsible agricultural supply chains, which is one of the tools that companies and governments have to respond to this new demand and explain also what risk-based due diligence means as a method to support producers and traders, especially in developing countries. And then I will conclude my presentation with some illustrations of uh, concrete examples of FIO's activities on responsible sourcing and agricultural supply chains. So as Dominic has mentioned in his introduction, there's a rising number of laws and regulations, especially in major importing markets, regarding the introduction of mandatory risk-based due diligence in agricultural supply chains, especially for large companies. And this type of legislation covers different topics, for example, corporate governance, transparency, and anti-bribery, anti-corruption, environmental and social due diligence, sustainability reporting, and there are also some specific concerns regarding you know, the development aspects and environmental aspects such as climate change and carbon emission, modern slavery and forced labor, child labor, decent work, etc. And you can see on this graph, you can't really see and you don't need to read what's in blue, but you can see the number of regulations and laws you know, starting from 2010 over the last 12 years, there's been an amazing increase in the number of regulations, especially in major importing markets. So what are the drivers? What drives governments to adopt this type of legislation? There are several types of drivers. Some of them are political, you know, big groups of major economies like the G7, the G20, 
In their meetings, they called for more importance given to responsible business conduct in global supply chains. And that was recently the case in the G7 agricultural minister's declaration last year, but also more recently, just a month ago, the, at the Global Forum for Food and Agriculture, the OECD FO guidance was mentioned. Uh, also, the uh, European Parliament Working Group on Responsible Business Conduct has called several times for more regulations, and also even the EU Code of Conduct on Responsible Food Business and Marketing Practices has also referenced the OECD FO guidance. But it's not only the political sphere, also industry and consumer organizations uh, have called for more sustainable supply chains and responsible business conduct and due diligence. For example, the CEO of BlackRock several times you know, has come up with some declaration in his annual declaration or annual statement to CEOs. He mentions several times you know, the need for responsible business conduct. And then, of course, the regulatory developments, if we can cite just a few recent developments, for example, the French uh, loi sur le devoir de, de vigilance, the Australia Modern Slavery Act, or the EU uh, draft directive on corporate sustainability due diligence are recent examples of this drive towards more regulations and more requirements for due diligence. So a key tool to address these requests from markets is the OECD FL guidance for responsible agricultural supply chains that you can see on the screen. Um, so this guidance was developed by the OECD and FAO starting in 2012, we, we had the first discussion. And then uh, from 2013 to 2015, guided by a multi-stakeholder advisory group, this uh, guidance was developed and it is now a leading global standard for agribusinesses and investors on risk-based due diligence in agricultural supply chain. The, the guidance is mainly meant for companies. It helps them observe the major standards for responsible business conduct, like the uh, RI principles, the principles for responsible uh, agricultural investment, and, and the, um, the VGGTs, the voluntary guidelines for the governance of tenure, the OECD guidelines on international enterprises, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a synthesis of these various standards and also an explanation of why these standards are useful and what they say on different challenges. Um, the guidance has three main sections, a section on, on the what, so that is namely a, a modern enterprise policy that companies are free to adopt or adapt to suit their own needs and to derive, to design their own corporate policies on RBC. The how, which is probably the most important part of the guidance and the, the, the most value it adds, is this five-step five framework for risk-based due diligence, where basically the, uh, the different steps of you know, what a company should do to identify, assess, mitigate risks and reports on them are highlighted. And also it has a third part, which is quite concrete on you know, concrete and specific measures for risk prevention and mitigation in various areas of risk, which can be, for example, human rights, uh, worker rights and labor rights, environmental risks, uh, technology, corruption and bribery, uh, and other aspects like food security and nutrition, which are quite important in, uh, in the guidance. So FAO and OECD are now finalizing a new joint implementation plan for the next five years, 2023 to 2028, which will succeed the plan that was that just finished uh, last year. Now, FAO's work on responsible business conduct in agriculture is very varied. The guidance is one pillar of this work. There are also others. The idea is that we want to encourage development through responsible value chains by helping governments design better policies to guide responsible business conduct among companies and other stakeholder groups, and also to help companies reduce negative social and environmental impacts of their operations, especially in countries where they source agricultural products, which are often developing countries. We will focus on this part of the agri-food supply chain, the developing country part. So the idea is to identify and prevent harm in global supply chains and work you know, with a full value chain approach with all the value chain operators you know, for better development outcomes. 
Now, I will give a few examples of a few activities for responsible agricultural product chains because it can sound you know, very abstract and general. I think it's important that we go you know, into the details of the implementation. So, for example, um, last uh, at the end of 2021, um, FAO and OECD, with support, financial support from GIZ and, and BMZ, the German Ministry for International Development and Cooperation, have launched a project to develop a business handbook on deforestation and due diligence in agricultural supply chains. So it's a handbook for businesses, for companies, which is based on the FAO OECD guidance that I mentioned and its five-step framework for risk-based due diligence. And it explains to company how they can address deforestation upstream in their suppliers and also downstream along the supply chain, how they can implement due diligence to try to assess and mitigate risks, but also to have a, a positive effect on forests. How to troubleshoot bot bottlenecks in considering you know, different uh, instances, different challenges and sensitive areas of work, and how to address current regulations or forthcoming regulations, like for example, the EU Directive on Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence, which is expected to be adopted sometime this year and how to engage with various stakeholders for doing this, because this is a key point. You know, companies cannot do everything on their own in terms of addressing environmental and social impacts. They really need to work hand in hand with government agencies, civil society organizations, local communities, unions of workers, et cetera, et cetera. So we are now in the process of finalizing the handbook. We are also producing a, a short uh, version with key messages, which will be translated in a few key language where Deforestation issues are salient, and we expect to launch the guide, the handbook, uh, in June this year. Another concrete example of uh, EFL's work on responsible business conduct is in tropical food value chains. We have a project which focuses on sustainability in pineapple and avocado value chains. These are high growth commodities which generate a lot of cash export earnings for developing countries. So the project helped to help businesses and organizations of producers to understand how they can reduce adverse impacts on local development in their sectors. So it aims to, it aims to provide technical guidance for producer organizations, small and medium enterprises, exporters, packers, and other actors upstream in the value chain. And it also introduces the OECD FAO guidance and the concept of risk-based due diligence to producers and also the different operators along supply chains to advance sustainability in key commodity markets. Another example in another commodity sector, which is quite important to developing countries, is the, the banana export sector, which generates about 10 billion US dollars every year for developing countries you know, creating hundreds of thousands of jobs in the world, especially in rural areas. So the forum is a global multi-stakeholder platform to facilitate collaboration between stakeholder groups and the dissemination of best practices on sustainable production and trade of bananas. It has more than 200 members representing retailers, importers, exporters, producer organizations, governments, trade unions, civil society organizations, and research and development institutions. Among the uh, exporter organizations, we have IAB, and we have here today, we have the pleasure to have uh, Jose Hidalgo from the Ecuadorian Banana Exporter Association. The forum has different working groups working on each of the three dimensions of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental, and it also has task force on specific issues and gather actors to facilitate development solutions for sustainable business in the banana value chain, working on topics like climate change mitigation, promoting living wages, promoting decent work, gender equity, fighting global diseases of concern like uh, TR4, Fusarium wilt TR4, which is a big concern for the banana industry. Then finally, a last example of concrete work of FAO is the Global Agri-Food Climate Initiative which is an international multi-stakeholder collaboration platform on measuring and reducing GHG emissions in agricultural supply chains. GHG is greenhouse gas. 
So the aim of, the, uh, of this Global Agri-Food Initiative is to facilitate collaboration on climate action in agricultural power supply chains from downstream retailers to upstream suppliers and producers to build consensus on common methods in the agri-food sector to measure and to reduce GHG, to facilitate technical assistance and access to, to credit, especially for developing countries and small and medium enterprises, and to have a focus on scope three emissions, which are namely the emissions that companies do not control directly, but that come from their suppliers in their supply chain in globally traded agricultural commodities. The uh, initiative was announced at the last COP, last November in Sharm el Sheikh, and the, it's going to be launched uh, this year. So I will stop here and give the screen to, uh, to Tomislav for the next presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pascal, for your very insightful pr uh, presentation, for presenting, I would say, a fair normative work in the area, but also the very concrete example of what we do in support of uh, a number of, uh, of uh, supply chains. So thank you very much. I know, Pascal, that you have to, to leave us uh, for a, a last minute uh, uh, called uh, meeting, uh, but I thank you very much for being with us even briefly, and I'm sure that Tomislas will now uh, go on with a, a great presentation. So Tomislas, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Pascal. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Dominique. And uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here and learning a little bit more about what we're doing in terms of responsible sourcing um, and, and some of the trends that we're seeing in terms of trade and sustainability criteria and how that affects different actors in different places in the supply chain. So in my presentation here, I'll, I'll run through four major areas um, um, that are really based around a report that we launched last year, in October of last year, on agricultural cooperatives and risk-based due diligence, right? Um, I, I, and more or less, the, the objective was that was to try to, to bring agricultural cooperatives into the global discourse on trade um, and supply chains, um, because they're such an important development actor, and I'll get to that in my presentation. So first, I'll outline why trade in agricultural cooperatives. Um, there after, I'll, I'll outline a little bit more um, about sustainability requirements, global trade and development, right, and, and um, illustrate how that has changed over time um, and, and really what uh, risk-based due diligence is um, in, in reality. Uh, the fourth area I'll discuss is um, how do we apply a risk-based due diligence model uh, to agricultural cooperatives, right? If, if we're seeing that as becoming an increasing requirement by suppliers downstream in the supply chains, how do cooperatives even adapt um, to, to, to these requirements, considering um, uh, the challenges that they face. And, you know, likewise, um, smaller um, economic actors in supply chains, such as small and medium enterprises, face similar challenges um, um, in uh, low and middle income countries to address these, these type of issues. So it's very relevant uh, for all actors upstream. And lastly, I'll close with some key takeaways and recommendations that we've outlined specifically in our report. So really, why trade in global, um, why trade in, in agricultural cooperatives? Well, we know that um, development is a very important part of this equation, right? Agricultural cooperatives are what we've called frontline actors in reducing poverty in agricultural sourcing communities. So, you know, around the world, from Uganda to, um, you know, to, to, to Brazil, to, to Argentina, to, to many other countries that trade uh, globally, um, we have agricultural sourcing communities where there are farmers, um, small and medium enterprises, many different actors that are dependent on the global dynamics um, um, of uh, demand and supply, right? Um, and, and as such, agricultural cooperatives are imperative because they do reach those who are often forgotten, including smallholders, um, and, and, and serve as a very good springboard to bring them into global trade um, and markets. Um, they provide, thus they provide aggregated market access, right? Um, in helping small smallholders reach markets, agricultural cooperatives provide a platform for negotiating with different buyers, right? For aggregating services and distribution channels. And importantly, um, they provide a capacity building function to their members, right? So they provide training services um, and allow for greater scale and uptake of sustainability and trade requirements, including um, what we're focusing on here today, 
um, um, the global movement for risk-based due diligence. Um, and you know, cooperatives are a very, very powerful tool to be able to extend that message to um, their members and you know, in turn, reduce development impacts as a result. Now, what's really interesting about this discussion is that you know, cooperatives have limited access to GVCs, right? So we're not only discussing, um, uh, we're having a discussion on how to help cooperatives address trade standards, sustainability trade standards. We're also having a conversation of how we can enhance the access of agricultural cooperatives to trade in global markets, which is absolutely crucial for poverty reduction. Now, as we'll see here, um, you know, this is a really uh, uh, um, um, kind of, you know, quick overview of trade standards, uh, um, sustainability standards, voluntary standards over the years, right? Um, from 1950 until 2023, we really see um, different types of movements that have helped um, create the, the evolution to where we are today with responsible sourcing um, and risk-based due diligence standards, right? First, early, we, we started with food safety standards in the 1950s and 1960s. Right. And and, you know, uh, um, characteristic of that is the launch of the Codex Alimentarius, which is led by the FAO and the WHO um, to, to really regulate food safety standards. Right. And, and to create a common thread across the board of, of what the expectations are for food production um, and the health standards that are associated to that. Now, with progress in the 1980s, we, we see, you know, we've already have a, 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 a growth of global agri-food trade, right, which has reached precedented levels that the world had never seen before. Um, and, you know, what was previously normal in terms of organic foods, um, we, we saw the growth of, of, of a new um, a market trend, and that's organic standards, right, and, and um, greater um, many buyers and, and, and lead companies in um, markets such as the United Kingdom, the United States and in the European Union began to start requesting specific organic based standards from their suppliers upstream um, in developing countries, right? And, and there's some really great examples to that in the report that we've launched. Now, you know, moving up towards closer to 2023, we see the growth of fair trade standards, which is really um, something that is much more ingrained in development, right? And looking at how um, development and different actors um, in upstream can be um, involved uh, um, um, in, in responsible uh, production, right? Um, looking at everything from unit cost to um, decent work challenges. Now, we, as we move closer, we see the development of multi-stakeholder initiatives and retail standards, right? And multi-stakeholder initiatives are, are really something that have been new, um, you know, since the 1990s. Um, and these have, you know, included um, um, the uh, platforms such as the responsible soy platforms, responsible uh, palm oil, um, even responsible biofuels, right? Which is something that we're working on separately at the FAO to create greater awareness and bring this discussion more closely to, um, to that area. Area. Um, you know, and, and multi-stakeholder initiatives really sought to uh, were really designed to onboard different perspectives into the creation of standards, right? So different NGOs, um, workers' organizations include in, ensure that trade is more responsible um, and more reflective of different developmental challenges um, in uh, production and trade. Now, as we move towards the end, we see global source of uh, responsible sourcing and management standards or, or, or responsible business conduct and risk-based due diligence as we know it today, right? And Pascal mentioned that since, um, you know, the growth of, of through the introduction of legislation uh, since um, two, uh, 2011, excuse me, um, with the introduction of the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, and many others, including our own standard, which is the OECD file guidance for responsible agricultural supply chains. Now, what, what these standards really speak to and, and these expectations are, you know, Pascal mentioned the main um, um, areas here um, um, in terms of thematics, but they, what they all really seek to do is to curb environmental and social impacts in production and trade and ensure that sourcing takes place within the limits of development, right? We know that the demand for food will continue to grow, but we also know that the world can only produce and trade so much uh, without impacting um, on, on, on communities and on the environment around the world, right? So the, the objective of, of, of this movement of responsible sourcing and risk-based due diligence is to introduce a business model to help companies understand what they can do to proactively mitigate risks along the way. 
Now I'll get into the five stuff specifically um, um, uh, framed to, to a cooperative lens, um, but before that I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the main characteristics of what is risk-based due diligence, right? And this wheel comes from the OECD file guidance for responsible agricultural supply chains. Well, in effect, risk-based due diligence is rooted in adapting business models to identify, assess, mitigate, and prevent developmental impacts in the own business operations of a company, but also those of their suppliers, namely the supply chain. Um, all companies have risks, right? It's impossible to find a business that does not have a risk to development in one way or another. But th the guidance in itself helps companies understand that along this spectrum, um, there are uh, there is a process of severity and likelihood of different risks taking place, right? So by understanding how a company can impact on development, um, 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 they can categorize the severity and the likelihood of these risks taking place. Importantly, uh, risk-based due diligence considers the leverage of the impacts cause and what companies can do to exercise their leverage in a supply chain. So, you know, if you're a downstream supplier um, or a downstream buyer, for instance, in the United Kingdom or in the Netherlands or, or, or in the United States or Finland, um, you know, if you are not satisfied with, with the, the, the sourcing um, um, activities or even maybe even risks identified with uh, your suppliers down upstream in the supply chain, um, you can use your leverage to try to in, enhance better business practices amongst those suppliers. Um, now, importantly, risk-based due diligence is flexible and it's tailored to companies of different sizes, including cooperatives, as we'll hear in a moment. Um, it's dynamic and ongoing um, and informed by stakeholder engagement, right? So um, including the voices of different actors is absolutely crucial here so that companies know that their policies, um, that their activities are actually reflective of the reality um, in, in terms of development impacts and not only their perception of what those impacts may be. Now, lastly, and my most favorite point of this is that it views disengagement as the last resort, right? So if a company identifies is a development risk, be that child labor, be that deforestation, or many other risks um, in terms of you know, water use or overuse of freshwater resources in the supply chains, instead of terminating a business relationship, the OECD file guidance highlights how companies can work with those suppliers to address and remedy um, instead of terminating and ending that business relationship. We know that in developing countries in particular, these business relationships are often extremely important and they're often lifelines for many farmers um, and many who survive in agricultural sourcing communities. So encouraging better business practices is really a core feature of the OECD file guidance. Now, what does this mean for cooperatives, right? Cooperatives are different. They're they have they're something in between, you know, an, an SME and something you know more complex than an SME in many ways because they have a membership framework to them, um, and they often struggle with severe funding challenges, as we'll hear um, from um, our colleagues today um, in our panelists. Well, you know. According to the five-step framework of the OECD file guidance, one can really see that there are excellent entry points for cooperatives to engage um, in, in this discourse and market themselves better um, to, to hopefully integrate um, um, into uh, GBCs if they're not already trading in global supply chains. So number one is establish company management systems, right? So within a cooperative, integrating policies um, that cooperatives can, can, can use to drive responsible business practices, including among Amongst their members, right? Helping their members understand um, and, and bring out common risks um, that could take place in the context of production, including deforestation, child labor, and many others. Um, identification and assessment and prioritization of risks, um, helping members understand um, how they can they can map these challenges um, and 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 really pinpoint what the main issues are. Are they possibly taking place in the context of undeclared work? Um, can uh, sourcing and production be irritating food security um, with a greater focus on export markets? If so, um, those are some of the issues that should be prioritized in cooperation with their members. Um, now, now, step three is really designing and implementing a strategy to respond to those risks that, that, um, that have been identified, right? And Cooperatives together with their members can design action plans um, um, to, to uh, remedy some of these risks or, or reduce um, the likelihood of them taking place. Now, other actors such as NGOs can also be considered to be onboarded into these activities at the upstream level. 
Verification is extremely important as a step four. So making sure that, you know, you just don't design an action plan that cooperatives um, um, uh, have follow up and continuity with their members um, to ensure that this regularly fits in um, with their activities and also connects with certification schemes. Many cooperatives have already existing activities um, that are designed to, um, to facilitate audits and you know, voluntary cert certification standards. So really connecting that with um, ongoing activities is extremely important. Lastly, reporting on supply chain due diligence is absolutely crucial because the world needs to know what that cooperative is doing. And importantly, um, it, what's, what's key here is to know that cooperatives can better market themselves to downstream suppliers as a responsible, um, um, as a responsible actor um, in supply chains, right? And, and enhance their potential to be able to trade globally. Lastly, some things to consider um, and in terms of recommendations, build the house. Um, ensure that um, when we're talking about risk-based due diligence, that we just don't jump in with uh, integrating a five-step framework, but that um, a cooperatives really consider their existing management issues, right? Including financial issues, staff issues, and any gaps, right? Um, uh, without considering that, you know, the, the, the impact would be, uh, wouldn't be as, as efficient and sustainable. Uh, setting the scene, really communicating what this is in terms of market expectations and in terms of, uh, of strengthening their own business models, right? Moving beyond VSS and certification. So uh, introducing um, the five-step framework and training and extension service tailored to the needs of all cooperative members. Um, considering the benefits, right? Understanding that this is, um, um, this is an opportunity to reduce uncertainty in business um, and look for opportunities um, as a responsible supplier. Lastly, involving others, integrating and embedding multi-stakeholder cooperation throughout the process. Colleagues, I'll end here um, and I'll pass the floor back to Dominique. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tomislas, for a, a really an excellent presentation and for also being, again, very concrete on how, uh, on how risk-based due diligence is applied, uh, particularly to, uh, to agriculture cooperatives. I find that super interesting. So thank you very much. And uh, now I would like to, to open the, the panel discussion during, the, during which our panelists will further elaborate on how upstream actors in the agri-food sector, particularly agricultural cooperatives, small holders, and small businesses can address development challenges to meet the changing market needs of export, trade, and sustainability. And today, our first speaker in the panel uh, is Ms. Claire kask -Kuk. Uh, Ms. Cook is Director for Policy Advocacy and Member uh, Mobilization uh, at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. The World Business Council for Sustainable Development is a private sector-led community of over 200 of the world's le leading sustainable businesses working collectively to accelerate the system transformation needed for a net zero, nature positive, and more equitable future. With such a bright agenda, uh, Ms. Kluck, Kluck, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I actually had written some of this just to explain where I work already, but now I don't need to repeat it. So really helpful. Thank you. And I'm honored to be here and happy that this conversation is happening with such a focus on Geneva, which is also where WBCSD is based. We have offices in other places around the world, but based here and exciting to see the FAO taking the leadership in this space, also in Geneva, engaging with WTO and many other organizations. So what I wanted to focus on, and I'll just make a few comments and really looking forward to dialogue and having a conversation, is around the role of companies and business in collaboration with, co with cooperatives in particular, in order to improve supply agricultural supply chains and then also to share some examples and key themes that we have seen in the responsible sourcing in food and agriculture space, in particular around a project that we have around the Global Agribusiness Action on Equitable Livelihoods, which has a strong focus on equity, which is a core priority for us as an organization. So practically speaking, what I can share on the cooperative side, and I was really listening with a lot of attention to what Tomislav was sharing and the results of the study, 
a, a central theme is the value of collaboration. And a particular example that we I can use is, and this is input that we've also collected from a colleague who leads our soft commodities forum, which has a lot of the world's leading agricultural commodity companies as members. So ADM, Bungie, Cargill, Kofco International, Viterra, and Louis Dreyfus. And they're having a lot of focus on the Cerrado soy supply chain. And what we are finding and what we're seeing from those examples when we're looking at how to improve that particular value chain is the importance about engaging in dialogue and action planning with indirect suppliers, which includes cooperatives. So not just direct suppliers, but the indirect suppliers to promote traceability schemes and monitoring systems to ensure deforestation and conversion-free soy supply chains. So it's really that big focus on traceability and collaboration across the value chain. And that we see cooperatives offering a gateway to a community of producers. So not just individual producers, but really many different ones. And that they're really helpful in enabling collective investment and equity-minded approaches. So that include farmers and make sure that farmers are part of the conversation. So when you have these large companies involved, having the role of, um, having that role of a cooperative as a center, center, central anchoring point is really important. And we also see that cooperatives can play an important role in helping prepare producers, helping prepare farmers to upcoming market standards and regulations. And they can also help introduce, kind of generate some thinking around market-based solutions to encourage greater sustainable production. So that's a particular example to share about dialogue and action plan that gateway to farmers and also helping work with farmers and preparing them about upcoming market solutions and standards. That's the one example I wanted to highlight on and also had a bit of a brainstorming a conversation with Thomas Lav as we were preparing for this and discussing so much about you know the importance of obviously public-private partnerships, the right incentives that need to be put in place, the key role of digitalization and transparency. There is so much to cover and there is limited time. So what I think would also be really important is to share uh, work that we have done where we worked with particular companies to create case studies about how large agri-food companies can engage and strengthen small and medium-sized agri-food companies in their value chains to better enable market access. That's a, a specific example I wanted to share. So we worked with companies like Bayer, OCP Group, Danone, many others to look at um, how can they scale sustainable procurement practices and improve SME supplier engagement? And some of the key themes that came out of this, which some of this I've, I've, I've seen mentioned before and some I haven't, is, is obviously central, is a stable, resilient and transparent supply chain is essential for an agribusiness sector. And we've seen a lot of uh, challenges, especially to SMEs, and cooperatives because of climate change, because of the impact of COVID-19, list goes on. So what this work with the big co with the co with the corporations showed, which was a really interesting conclusion. One number one is the benefits from empowering women, which is one of the most most important conclusions, and seeing women as agents of change. The other one was about we need a solid business case. So it cannot be seen as a charitable project. We really need a solid business case, which links me to my third point, which about potential areas and opportunities around innovative funding mechanisms. For example, an initial grant or foundation, which can help unlock more sources of funding. And this is something that's why we are also so interested in engaging in these conversations and highlighting this. There's obviously a lot of issues around risk, and that was mentioned before in a lot of the work that's done, but there can be certain unlocks that can also lead to a solid business case and help maybe reduce some of that risk. And there can be interesting funding mechanisms from grants and foundations that can unlock more investment.
The other one, and it's not a big surprise, but it's quite self-evident, but really important, is to have effective communication with suppliers, really based on the trust and transparency themes, but the communication aspect is key. And then, and this is also mentioned a lot, but it is, and I can share more about the particular case studies that we published and the work that went there, is to identify barriers and build capacity. It's not a big surprise, but it came out loud and clear from the work that these companies were doing and some of the lessons learned. This kind of concludes my remarks. Happy to answer some questions. What I did want to highlight that we see an interesting future development and something to look at about the role of the voluntary carbon markets in strengthening farmer livelihoods through nature-based solutions and regenerative agriculture. And obviously, we also be looking at the central priority of having accountability and also accountability for corporations, corporate accountability frameworks and corporate guidance to best support farmers and local communities. We see that growing need for harmonization and alignment. So there is a key role, obviously, for farmers and cooperatives to play, but also a key role for corporations to play in this. And that's why I mentioned accountability. With that, thank you very much and happy to answer any wow. questions later on. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Kaskekuk, for, for such a great presentation and from presenting the perspective uh, from the private sector and highlighting so many important aspects. Uh, for example, the issue of equity, equity-minded approaches, traceability and cooperation across the value chain, incentive digitalization, effective communication, importance of capacity building, I mean, all very important aspects that in, in itself would deserve a lot of conversation. And a very important point that you mentioned was also the, the impact in terms of, for example, women empowerment, which I find is, uh, is indeed very, very important. So thank you very much for that. And uh, our next speaker today uh, will be um, Mr. Jose Antonio Hidalgo Molina. And Mr. Molina is the executive uh, director of the Association of Banana Exporters of Ecuador, which represents more than 70% of banana exporters from Ecuador, and which promotes the competitiveness and sustainability of the banana industry. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hidalgo Molina, the floor is yours, and welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the invitation to participate and speak at this webinar. My name, as you mentioned, is Jose Antonio Hidalgo. I'm the executive director of AEVE, the Association of Banana Exporters of Ecuador. As you might know, Ecuador is the biggest exporter of bananas, accounting for about one third of global banana shipments. 30% of our plantations in Ecuador are in hands of around 5,000 smallholders, some who sell the production through cooperative systems. Agriculture cooperatives have an important role in supporting small scale farmers by giving them access to the inputs they need, like seeds and development funds, sharing new and more sustainable ways of production and understanding key statistics about their farms. In fact, cooperatives promote sustainable agricultural practices and contribute to rural development. Within AEVE, we, we have dedicated a commission responsible for supporting small producers and promoting the development of cooperatives. Currently, we work with more than 1,200 small producers. In particular, we organize trainings aiming to teach producers how to collect, record, and derivative value from data re with regards to the management of their farms, such as application of agrochemicals, purchasing of materials, water usage, among others. Based on that, we are able to provide them with recommendations on how better use of resources, adopt more sustainable practice, improve productivity, and scale up. In the same vein, other banana producers associations such that are partners with us, such as Agrovan, foster co-ops through training and workshop explaining how cooperatives work and how is this process to follow up to get group certifications. 
last but not least, work with small producers and cooperatives, focus on the implementation of fair labor practices in compliance with the Ecuadorian law, aiming to ensure workers are paid a fair wage and provide with safe working conditions. I would like to work, walk you through the success story and share with you some lessons learned from our smallholders, in particular from the angle of the dynamic between the national and international dimension of our industry. From a national perspective, you should know that the banana industry is the backbone of Ecuador's economy and it contributes significantly to the country's overall economic development. It represents 35% of the agricultural GDP. It employs about 250,000 people and supports an additional, an additional 400,000 jobs in related industries such as packaging, transportation, and logistics, to name just a few. The industry provides jobs at all levels, from farm laborers to export professionals, and is a crucial source of income for many rural communities in Ecuador. From an international perspective, the banana industry is the driver of Ecuadorian businesses abroad, serving as a flagship of other of our country entrepreneurship in new markets. Where banana arrives, other products such as shrimp, cocoa, flowers, and coffee are full. For that reason, we are firm supporters of the opportunities enabled by globalization and international trade, as proof by the several free trade agreements Ecuador has with other countries and regions. We have a long built solid reputation of being reliable suppliers, thanks to the sustainability of our businesses models that produces banana of the highest quality to feed all families around the world at an affordable price. And this has been recognized by our business partners all around the world. And these national and international dimensions interacts in a free market dynamic where hundreds of Ecuadorian producers and exporters every day negotiate the prices of their products with importers and retailers of other countries. This dynamic has fostered competition among the sector and it has uh, and is what allowed us to position our country as the regional leader with examples of excellence like the first certified carbon neutral port of Latin America in Guayaquil. However, this dynamic come with some challenges. And I believe that properly analyzed, this could inform modern public policy, which should develop keeping smallholders as a point of reference. The first one is the imbalance on power and concentration of value on one side of the value chain, in particular, the retailing sector. This has been demonstrated by several reports elaborated both from private and public organizations, FAO included that indicates that barely 20% of the shelf price remains in the, con in the country of origin, which is later distributed between workers, producers, and exporters. 80% is concentrated in the other side of the value chain, the downstream. My first call to downstream actors is very simple. You should pay more for your bananas. You should not play at who's, uh, who who has the cheapest banana and rather educate and empower the consumer to be part of this sustainability journey. This is the only way to recognize the effort of smallholders that build the social and economic fabric of our rural areas. The second one is the technical barriers from certain jurisdictions that do not recognize the principle of different regions and different needs. Our producers fight every day to ensure that the quality standards of our bananas are in the line with international phytosanitary guidelines while protecting the plantations from the plague and pests like Siga, black cigatoka and fusarium tr4 native of the tropics and that require a specific plant protection products when these products are not recognized by importing markets simply because they do not have to fight the same plagues and pests, our producers need to either find alternatives or, or, or lose their harvest. 
often alternatives do not exist or are not viable or are more expensive. Often these technical buyers change several times in a short period, being a challenge in terms of adaptation, particularly for smallholders that do not have the capacity to monitor the changing regulatory environment at destination and means to test viable solutions. My second call in this regard will be, as I said before, different regions, different needs. This reality has motivated our government to pass a specific laws aimed to regulating the banana industry in Ecuador. We have, for instance, La Ley del Banan, or Banana Law, developed in response to the challenges faced by the industry, including low prices and production costs. We have, as well, a living wage for all workers recognized by our constitutions, by our constitution since 2008. And let, let me repeat, a living wage for all workers recognized in our constitutions since 2008. And minimum wages specific for the banana sector periodically adjusted based on the changes in the cost of living and other factors. However, given the international character of our industry, upstream actors like ourselves cannot address the development challenges alone without the effective participation of the downstream part of the value chain. In this regard, we welcome initiatives like the upcoming European Due Diligence Directive and the more recent German Supply Chain Act. However, we are concerned about the unintended consequences these provisions might have. While we do support transparent and mandatory mechanisms of due diligence, we are concerned that this might create a new burden to producers, in particular smallholders. This has been the case with private certification schemes. Despite being voluntarily, this in theory, in practice they are mandatory because retailers impose them, transferring the associated cost to the producer, which is particularly burdensome to some smallholders. My third goal in this regard will be to policymakers ensure that a system of shared responsibility is coupled with, a, with any due diligence to ensure that the costs related to sustainability standards are equal and fairly distributed all along the supply chain, from producers to consumers, passing through the rest of the chain, including supermarkets, all of them contributing to the common goal of sustainability proportionate to their participation in the value chain. I hope these examples help to illustrate the challenges being faced by the Ecuadorian banana industry in the global agri-food market. And I look forward for any question. Thank you for the opportunity of being here with you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Molina, for those very pertinent points in relation to your efforts to promote the competitiveness and sustainability of the banana industry in Ecuador, which, as you recall, is, is one of the, is the leading country in export of banana uh, worldwide. So thank you very much for that. And now we'll hear from Ms. Masha Middlebeck. And Ms. Middlebeck is the Program Director Value Chain Transformation at the Sustainable Trade in Initiative. Uh, IDH aims to accelerate and scale up sustainable trade by building impact-oriented coalition of front-running companies, civil society, governments, knowledge institutions, and other stakeholders in uh, several sectors. Uh, Ms. Middlebeck, the floor is yours, and I would like to ask you to, to try to, to stay within the the allocated time because our the previous speakers were a bit talkative i must say very interesting <laughs> but so let's uh, try to give that a shot thanks uh dominique um uh, hello everybody my name is marcia middlebeek indeed working at idh uh pleased to be here and, and happy also to share some uh some insights with you on on how we work on professionalizing cooperatives through the private sector i believe is there a presentation shared or i think NAR is about to share that. Is that correct? Yes, there yes. it's coming. It um, and then you can directly go to the second slide, uh, Pinar. Uh, though already mentioned what 
the IDH is the Sustainable Trade Initiative, maybe a few additional words for the ones that are not familiar with it. Headquartered in the Netherlands, around 300 employees globally and operated in 20, 20 landscapes and 12 commodity and sourcing regions worldwide. As mentioned, we seek to transform markets and change back business practices, uh, business practices on farmer level, business level, as well as sec sectoral level. And we seek to do that through convening locally and globally by bringing food system coalitions together, sector initiatives, stakeholder platforms, as well as co-creation together with the private sector, designing projects and programs that drive changes in markets and the food systems we operate in. Then in turn, co-invest in these project programs, value chains and business models that we seek to change. And based on the work we do, we generate insights and well, and look for further finance to scale our efforts. That's about uh, IDH. Let, let's move to the subject matter of today in the next slide. And, and well, as, as we are talking about uh, uh, seeking our downstream suppliers, which are often cooperatives, farmer organizations, had to help reducing environmental risk and social risk like child labor, uh, soil degradation, uh, that and but also make them more meaningful players in global trade. That journey starts by, by structurally investing and making cooperatives more professional, commercially viable and, and investable. So, so those words uh, Tomislav was referring to build a house, these really resonate. Because if these pharma-led business entities are not managed well, governed well, governed well that's actually the key risk, right? Uh, and, and we can then not expect them to have mature extension systems, service system in place through which they can train their members and reduce all kinds of supply chain risks we would like them to reduce. So in practice, what we often observe uh, is that the step of that professionalizing cooperatives on governance, business, uh, business management, financial management, having strong human resourcing in place is often skipped or doesn't get enough attention. So we directly kind of move to the next step. And therefore, the efforts which we are making in, in ad cooperatives to adopt trade and sustainability standards uh, and requirements are not going to be effective or stick if that house is not in order. Um, and as we all acknowledge it, that, that the more professional cooperatives are, the more likely they are also to adopt these trade and sustainability requirements more optimally. And apart from that, they have other benefits already mentioned by, by a few, and more efficient aggregation, improved productivity, quality, traceability, but also better value distribution in the value chain, where uh, we have data that, that based of working with pharma organizations and cooperatives that substantially reduce cost to source, but also the cost of servicing farmers. And apart from that, as mentioned as well, right, cooperatives deliver better services and inputs to their, to their members. So that there is a business case for investing and professionalizing uh, cooperatives, that's evident. The question is who and, and how should that be done? And can all these costs have, be bared by the private sector alone? Um, as IDH, we take a private sector approach in driving cooperative professionalism yeah, through the business models of the processors and the aggregators, off-takers we work with, and these can be corporates like Cargill, Nestle, but also Agri, SMEs in, in Africa. We assess how the sourcing and the service models of these companies can professionalize cooperatives and, and support graduation. For example, when it's through sourcing, we, we reflect on how to set the procurement practices in such a way like contracting, lies the price setting mechanism, payment mechanisms, premiums, to really set the right business incentives also for these cooperatives to scale, uh, grow and professionalize. On the other hand, we reflect on the service model. Yeah? So the services companies provide like access to inputs, training, markets, access to finance, and to tailor these services to different segments of cooperatives that are out there. Yeah? For example, more advanced segments, receive more specialized services and technologies or pre-finance or are linked to financial institutions, whereas more immature farmer organizations, cooperatives might receive more support on how to aggregate, manage their group, or how to register their, their, their entity. So, so far from perfect yet, but what we are see featuring in our portfolio is that we increasingly observe that, that companies include and tailor services supporting cooperatives to professionalize. Not, su not surprisingly, also that farmer segmentation or farmer organization segmentation is more prevalent in, in larger companies. 
and mostly based on performance indicators or sourcing potential. And though it's positive that companies adapt their sourcing and service models to allow for cooperatives to professionalize, but also work towards uh, the, the sustainability requirements, etc. We also acknowledge that this approach uh, that companies will typically only invest in the graduation to meet basically their needs, not necessarily the needs of the farm organizations or the sector at large, right? And that they're also more inclined to invest in the upper segments of the farm organizations, less so in, in, in the, those lower level segments. You can move to the next slide. And that's also my final slide. So to better integrate also that cooperative and sector needs and work more holistically on graduation and professionalizing farm organizations and cooperatives, but also unlock investments in that cooperative landscape. We're also testing a more holistic approach under the name AgriGrade where we join hands with a set of organizations you see featured here to improve cooperative performance in certain value chains, countries, and food systems. And that starts basically with that step one, assessing the cooperative landscape, gathering the data on, on gaps, strengths, weaknesses, and based on, on that analysis, that data uh, segments that, that cooperative landscape in different levels and design a targeted business development approach for each segment. And here, business development providers like, uh, like Agriterra can come in, but also other business uh, development providers or service providers can come in. Here, we also seek to leverage uh, the service delivery models of companies that are working with, with cooperatives to graduate them. Then in step three, uh, not necessarily sequential, but also partly in parallel with step two, is really improving the service delivery and the value chain performance. So optimize the effectiveness of the value chain and the businesses working with cooperatives, but also optimizing the service delivery uh, of these value chain actors towards farmer organizations and cooperatives. Then step four, uh, yeah, the more advanced cooperatives we seek to link to finance, inputs, and markets. And here, uh, financial service providers like Oracle Credit, but also the Farm Fit Fund and local financial institutions may come in. And this is also the space where we seek to test different funding me mechanisms to get more finance in that cooperative landscape. Then after these steps, we seek to reassess once more. These assessments are done by Scope Insight. They have developed an assessment tool to really measure the level of professionalism and performance of farmer organizations. And we seek to reassess to really see if that what level of professionalism and performance has increased and whether business development services were effective and cost efficient, but also whether more markets and finance were unlocked. And we can also test yeah, the hypothesis or assumptions that yeah, if you see more professional landscape of cooperatives, do we also see the absorption or better sustainable uh, practices in that landscape? Obviously, AgriGrade partners is, are not going to do this job alone. This, this approach seeks to be embedded in, in the local context and will collaborate uh, with the local governments, companies, and financial institutions in that uh, landscape. Far more to tell about this, obviously, and uh, but if interested, please reach out and happy to receive any questions, reflections uh, from your end. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Middlebeck. And obviously, as you say, much more could be said on that. But thank you for, for describing the private sector approach you, you use to make uh, indeed cooperatives more professional. And uh, and I like when, when you mentioned that uh, the, the more you make them professional, the more likely they are to adopt uh, sustainability, sustainability standards, which is indeed uh, very important. Thank you also for highlighting the the importance of data, data-driven uh, uh, approaches. Thank you very much for that. So our next speaker is Mr. Danilo Salerno. Mr. Salerno is the regional director at the International uh, Cooperative Alliance. ICA is a non-governmental organization which unites, represents, and serves cooperative worldwide. Uh, Mr. Salerno, the floor is yours, and welcome. Thank you very much. Good. Uh... Afternoon, good, well, good morning, afternoon, or evening uh, to all of you. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, really an honor to me uh, being here. Uh, thank you for to our colleagues, both at uh, headquarters uh, or Geneva, or uh, also uh, 
the Americas, our colleague from the Americas, FIO Regional Office, where I see uh, some of them are connected uh, because we are working very well at regional level as well. Um, my intervention will focus on three areas, um, mainly we are uh, International Corporate Alliance, a uh, few data and figures, uh, just to, to start from the latter point, uh, which was touched by the, uh, the previous colleague. Then how we fit uh, uh, with regards to uh, the uh, this event, this uh, uh, due diligence, uh, model and uh, and uh, uh, all the studies that uh, were mentioned, and maybe what we need to, to, to perform uh, or to to fit better, uh, not just uh, in general in a general sense, but also uh, in order to uh, attract those investments that were mentioned. So uh, the International Cooperative Alliance, as uh, it was said, uh, was funded in eighteen ninety five. Uh, so we have uh, a very uh, long, let's say, uh, tradition. Nowadays, uh, the International Cooperative Alliance represents uh, more than 315 uh, organi cooperative organizations from uh, 112 countries. Uh, those cooperative organizations represent more than uh, 1.2 uh, billion uh, direct members. Uh, and uh, em employ more than 100 uh, million people. So mostly, uh, roughly the 10% uh, of the uh, world employed population. Um, this uh, uh, ICA nowadays is uh, structured into four regional offices. I'm the uh, regional director for the Americas, but also the liaison uh, person for uh, cooperation with uh, with FIO with the UN rome based agencies. Uh, then we have eight uh, sectorial uh, organization. The one for uh, as we are talking about agriculture today. The one for uh, agriculture is the uh, ICAO International Cooperative Agriculture Organization. Then uh, we have a development platform. We have a youth committee, a gender committee. Uh, a cooperative law uh, committee and uh, a cooperative research uh, committee, and last but not the least, uh, uh, the uh, ISET Inter uh, International Cooperative Entrepreneurial Think Tank, uh, made by uh, big cooperative groups uh, 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 with particular focus, uh, like the one that is uh, global trade. So. Um, Going to the uh, data, uh, the last uh, edition of the World Cooperative Monitor, uh, which is the uh, index we released, uh, the ICA releases uh, every year, uh, showcasing uh, the impact that the 300 biggest uh, cooperative uh, of the world uh, have. This, uh, those information are very important to us, not just to set uh, and represent cooperative organization uh, from a, a policy at policy level, but also to understand, to have a better understanding of the impact uh, we have uh, at national level in terms of uh, sustainable growth and, and development. Uh, this index uh, released uh, last uh, December, uh, the, the last edition, uh, showcases uh, the 300 uh, biggest cooperative in terms of turnover, but at the same time, which is uh, which makes more sense to me, um, uh, showcases the uh, 300 uh, biggest cooperative in terms of turnover over GDP per capita. So the impact uh, they have at national level in terms of uh, personal uh, purchasing power. Uh, so if we have a look at it, um, and uh, I will copy uh, afterwards uh, the link uh, in the chat, uh, we see that uh, um, the, uh, among those 300 uh, biggest cooperatives uh, worldwide, the uh, um, big part of them are from the agriculture sector. 
uh, 100 uh, out of uh, 300 uh, of uh, the biggest one uh, are uh, active in the agricultural sector, while uh, 59 are active uh, of, of the biggest uh, are active from uh, in the consumers and retail sector. Uh, so roughly uh, merging these uh, first two uh, sectors, we have uh, we see that the uh, fifty three percent of the half uh, part of the three hundred big cooperative of the world, uh, let's say, cover. Uh, the uh, agriculture or food system supply chain, so production plus distribution. When we say production or agriculture, also fishery uh, is uh, uh, including and it is crucial to keep in mind uh, as part of the um, food system. Then if we go uh, to the type of uh, cooperatives, uh, the top 300 uh, per type of organization, Again, we see that uh, 126 cooperatives are from uh, the uh, agricultural sector uh, and plus uh, 70 uh, from the consumers and retail uh, sector. And uh, looking at the geographical distribution, uh, we have uh, among the 300, we have 90 cooperatives from uh, the Americas plus uh, uh, roughly, um, I would say 50 from Asia Pacific and uh, 160 more or less from uh, Europe. This is to say uh, data are important and uh, we have also at the same time to uh, improve our uh, data collection uh, because uh, uh, most of this uh, data comes from desk uh, research, desk analysis, where while just uh, a, um, a short percentage uh, comes from uh, data directly submitted or shared by uh, our members. So uh, in this sense, cooperation and partnership with uh, international organization and uh, research centers is crucial uh, to us, not just to identify those policies we need in terms of representation, but also which uh, financial or technical tools are uh, needed in order to improve uh, our action, both at national and uh, international uh, level. Uh, focusing on uh, agriculture, um, we have uh, the top 10 uh, in terms of turnover, uh, top 10 cooperatives coming from Japan, Korea, the US, Germany, uh, and, the, and again the US. While analyzing the uh, top 10 uh, in terms of turnover over GDP per capita, we'll, we have uh, India uh, with IFCO and another uh, Milk Marketing Federation, plus uh, Korea with uh, NAFC. Then we have cooperative from Brazil, Argentina, again US, and again Germany, uh, and so on. So the importance of data, as was uh, already mentioned. Uh, looking how we fit with regards to this uh, due diligence and uh, uh, all the other studies uh, where, which were mentioned. Um, and looking at uh, the um, risk analysis, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, mainly uh, four or, or uh, uh, five uh, areas uh, of this uh, due diligence risk analysis, uh, from my point of view, are already covered, uh, especially I refer to uh, human rights, labor rights, healthy uh, safety, as well as food security and uh, nutrition uh, standard. Let me just give you uh, share an example. Uh, I'm very familiar with uh, coming from uh, Costa Rica, uh, the uh, the country where the regional office from uh, of the Americas is uh, set up. Uh, we are uh, executing an interest, a very interesting uh, project called the House of Happiness, uh, funded by the EU delegation in Costa Rica. And uh, what we do is to provide um, uh, education and uh, uh, health um, services to those uh, migrants 
coming to uh, from uh, Panama or um, Nicaragua during the coffee uh, uh, season in order to uh, uh, pick up pick coffee uh, from uh, from the production and uh, to process those process those uh, coffee uh, via some cooperatives like Cooperativa Azul uh, we are working with. Uh, we uh, set up this project uh, exactly to avoid that uh, the, um, the, 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 the adults can uh, work in safe condition, uh, certificated uh, safe condition with uh, access to uh, health services while their children are uh, um, the, the, the group, the, the cooperative uh, is taking care of the children, giving them uh, education and education services uh, during the whole day. Uh, and this uh, is enhancing the uh, both the uh, labor standards uh, of the cooperative as well as the production, uh, the market production uh, of, uh, of the cooperatives because uh, everyone uh, works, let's say, in better condition and can perform uh, more, uh, say, safe uh, in, a, in, a, in a broader sense uh, from the respective point of view. Uh, it's so important. Salerno, to have... can, I, can I please ask you to wrap up? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm sorry, but... Uh... We no problem at all. Uh, regarding the, um, what, where, uh, how we fit, uh, we want to stress the importance to uh, set up partnership, enable uh, us to demonstrate our impact uh, uh, at local uh, community, uh, putting in action the seventh uh, principle of cooperative, the concern of community, as well as uh, try to uh, making the, uh, the sector, the different sectors uh, working together or uh, improving cop to cop uh, cooperation. What we need, we need uh, those uh, investments, we need this uh, technical assistance and training that was uh, mentioned. But above all, let me say that we should, what we need is to pass from the analysis to action. And why, uh, and that's why uh, I'm calling to a more concrete and more stable uh, and permanent partnership with uh, FIO and the other uh, mm -hmm. intergovernmental uh, organization uh, investing uh, on cooperatives on uh, our uh, organization with pilot pro uh, process uh, and project uh, in order to uh, go to concrete and have this uh, uh, in best practices to be showcased, uh, also contributing to the further analysis. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Salerno. I'm sorry for pushing you a bit towards the end, but thank you indeed for, for uh, providing us with your perspective from the, the cooperatives and the importance of indeed, uh, uh, you, 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 you refer to uh, the importance of data, data collection, but also the importance to transfer this data into, into action. And, and also thank you for providing the, the very concrete example of what you are uh, doing. Uh, today, our, our last uh, speaker uh, in the panel is Ms. Catherine Lundqvist. Uh, Ms. Lundqvist is Economic Affairs Officer in the Economic Research and Statistics Division of WTO. And uh, Ms. Lundqvist, uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction and for inviting me to be here. I'll just try to keep my remarks very brief. I, I think it's wonderful that uh, the WTO Miss Me Informal Working Group is invited to participate in this conversation. So this group is a group of 97 members of the WTO. They cover all regions of the world and all levels of development. And they try to really uh, produce concrete outcomes and act as a, an area where members can discuss new ideas and try to brainstorm about possible solutions. In our discussions, there have been a lot of different topics that have been raised, and they've, they've ranged from digitalization to uh, um, trade facilitation. And one topic that has also been raised has been smallholder farmers. This is uh, a huge, very big part of many economies of the world, up to 50% of, of certain economies. And it's important to try to facilitate trade by these actors. Um, the group itself uh, has looked into this issue, we've received one presentation from uh, the Brazil Ministry on um, food supply on the agriculture innovation agenda in, in that economy. 
Um, and the group also holds annual conversations with small businesses. And during those conversations, the issue of sustainability standards, which I've heard over and over in this conversation, have been uh, brought to the group's attention. So it's, it's something that's on our radar. And then I'll just end quickly with tomorrow, we're going to release our third small business champions. And this is for... Uh, um, this is, this is for uh, chambers of commerce, industry associations, small businesses, and non-governmental organizations to submit proposals. This year's theme is going to be helping smallholder farmers go global. So it's very in line with this discussion today. The winners, winners will be announced on Miss Me Day, 27th of June, 2023. And we're looking forward to see what proposals there are. So thank you again for having me today and I will turn it over to you. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lundqvist, and indeed for, for giving a brief overview of the work of the, the, the working group on uh, MSMEs, and, uh, which is very active, and we look forward to, to definitely engage uh, more with you. Uh, unfortunately, as you, as you can figure out, colleagues will not have time for a, for a Q&A session, but there was a very rich exchange in the Q&A modules with uh, questions being asked directly to the panelists, which has been responded to, and we'll make sure this is documented in the proceedings of this meeting. So, and now it is my pleasure to give the floor to Marjolaine Ennis uh, for concluding remarks. Ms. Ennis is the chair of the OECD FAO Advisory Group on Responsible Agriculture Supply Chains, led by the OECD and FAO. She's also a counselor at the permanent representation of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to the OECD, working on responsible business conduct, social affairs, employment policies, migration, and digitalization. Uh, Ms. Ennis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, hello to all of you. Uh, I hope you, uh, you, you still have uh, some time to uh, just listen to some uh, concluding remarks mm -hmm. about this extremely interesting uh, uh, panel and uh, whole discussion on, um, on, on development trade and um, a responsible business conduct. So uh, as, as announced, I'm uh, indeed speaking uh, in my capacity of chair of the OECD FAO advisory group, uh, which is part of this rather unique and successful cooperation between the OECD and the FAO around the implementation of the OECD FAO um, guidance on responsible agriculture supply chains on uh, which uh, Mr. Liu from FAO um, uh, explained uh, what, what this is all about. So actually this guidance helps businesses uh, in carrying out their due diligence and um, it also uh, promotes or it, it aims to promote a common understanding on due diligence. Um, and so this advisory group, I will not go into this right now, just two words on it. It's, it's a multi-stakeholder body representing more than 60 members from government, business, civil society, academia, trade unions, and certification bodies, uh, including some of the speakers today. Uh, for example, um, uh, the speak Ms. Middlebeek from IDH and uh, Ms. Clea Keske-Cut from uh, World Business Council on Sustainable Development, they are members of the advisory group. And so this advisory group tries to contribute um, and gives advice to the OECD and FAO on their work to implementing or promoting the implementation of this uh, guidance. Um, so let me just uh, go quickly to uh, the interesting discussion of today. Um, which uh, is also actually at the heart of what we do at the OECD uh, FAO advisory group. That means uh, discuss difficult challenges and uh, consider how responsible business conduct and due diligence can help to overcome them. Uh, so my, my, I, my takeaways from the discussion are, well, first of all, we are discussing a very important topic. Global trade in food and agricultural commodities is worldwide huge, not only from an economic point of view, but also from a development perspective. Agriculture contributes up to two thirds of GDP in some low income countries and supports the livelihood of over 1 billion people. So uh, this is also um, what Mr. Hidalgo showed uh, uh, from his specific case uh, and what it means for, uh, for the GDP, the banana production and export means for his uh, uh, specific country. 
Um, so today's trade policy environment in food and agriculture supported by actors such as the FAO and WTO have made enormous progress in discouraging unfair trading practices, reducing market uncertainty and facilitating coordination between countries. So this, this multilateral framework has expanded global trade and has helped many countries progress and, and, and grow. Um, and the OECD FAO guidance on responsible agriculture supply chains has actually contributed that, as we, we saw also from Mr. Yu's uh, presentation um, on the OECD guidance, uh, which actually had his, its anniversary this week. It was seven years uh, since it was, uh, was launched in Paris. Um, so since that launch, it has become the, the leading global reference, as uh, Mr. Liu also pointed out, uh, for responsible business conduct in uh, agricultural supply chains. So today's discussion was so interesting, I think, because it made this clear link between trade, development, and the importance of doing RBC. It made this very visible and responsible uh, business conduct in agricultural supply chains can help business and governments transform global markets into more inclusive, sustainable and resilient food systems. Likewise, it can arm trade and development actors to better cope with supply chain shocks caused by uh, diseases, changing trade, trade requirements, natural disasters and climate change. Uh, maybe needless to say, making trade rela relations more resilient and sustainable for the actors and the resources in producing countries now and in the future is, of course, in the interest of all. We have talked about food security, we have talked about the environment, related climate change effects, and the livelihood of farmers in uh, low and middle income countries. So this discussion underlined the role of agricultural cooperatives and the role they can play in agricultural supply chains uh, as frontline actors in development in those low and middle income countries, uh, as was uh, pointed out very well by the presentation of uh, Mr. Uh, Tomislav Ivancic from the FAO. And he pointed also out that those cooperatives struggle to have access to export markets and uh, trade in global value chains, even with food and commodities for which demand is high, such as uh, food. Nevertheless, cooperatives remain a good option in terms of the coordination of efforts in making agricultural production more sustainable, which also Mr. Salerno showed from uh, ICA. In addition, it seems that if they succeed in making their production more sustainable by implementing due diligence, they have higher chances to access the global supply chains because they respond to the requirements in terms of sustainability by buyers and traders. So the central question that we have dealt with today was how can we make sure then that those cooperatives um, in, in, in practice can deal with the challenges uh, in implementing RBC standards and have, have access to uh, global supply chains and what is needed for that. So this was, of course, the, the question uh, which, which is not only uh, uh, for the cooperatives, but for all the actors in the global supply chains involved. And so there were many suggestions I heard today. Um, uh, for example, we should st start by making a greater effort to listen to the different actors in agricultural supply chains and consider the, their economic, social and environmental needs. Um, dialogue and action plans were, meant, uh, uh, were mentioned and informing cooperatives about RBC were were pointed out as important. For example, our co colleague uh, Clea from uh, WBCSD and Mr. Salerno from uh, ICA pointed this, this out. Another important uh, action point is to build capacity. And Tomislav also mentioned this, uh, and it's also uh, clear in from the from the, the report. Uh, so it's 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 um, it, it, there are many uh, recommendations in this report on how to build the capacity of co cooperatives and create a better understanding of how to integrate risk-based and how to gain then a competitive advantage in global value chains. And Mr. Hidalgo has underlined with respect to that also the need for a balanced value chain that ensures a living income for all the actors also in the upstream part. 
So maybe this leaves us with the challenge between the limited resources for entering the market and the possibility of doing due diligence according to the five step framework uh, in the guidance. This, this risk uh, or this, this, this challenge risks to be a vicious circle because access to the market um, uh, hands to more resources may be a first step uh, to to uh, doing uh, RBC. So you, first, you need the money to do RBC, and RBC can help you enter the global mar uh, the global market. So how to exit from this vicious circle? Um, some uh, some solutions were mentioned there as well. Uh, a greater role maybe for public private partnerships is a solution uh, to open sources for funding for cooperatives. Um, make a solid business case for RBC and make it possible, for example, through training, as Ms. Uh, Middlebake from I IDDH uh, pointed out. Um, there was also uh, mentioned the role that exporting organizations can play in promoting RBC among small farmers. And um, we saw also that um, these efforts, then we should pay attention that these efforts uh, are not done in the narrow interest of the organization that promotes them, but also in the interest then of small farmers. And we saw this systemic data-driven approach uh, as uh, proposed by I IDH, which could be a solution to that. So finally, um, this discussion we, we, we are having with the trade uh, community about RBC and how to drive better development outcomes through global agri-food trade has, be, has been very valuable for building our common understanding, I think, uh, our common understanding of the challenges and their solutions. And it will be hopefully uh, followed by many other discussions and maybe with also with the, the group uh, mentioned by WTO, uh, maybe we could have more uh, common discussions of this type. So I want to, to, to um, stop here and thank FAO very much for, for this great um, webinar uh, and thank uh, all the speakers for their, for their uh, great uh, presentations and technical expertise and for all, uh, all the people uh, listening uh, for, for, for your attention until the end. So hopefully until the next time, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ennis, for those closing remarks. And indeed, I join you in, uh, in, uh, in thanking all, all the speakers, and, uh, but also the participants uh, for joining the session, and also the, the colleagues in the FAO Market and Trade Division, and my own colleagues here in Rome. Uh, as you know, FAO in Geneva will continue to organize uh, these dialogues on the topics of agriculture and fisheries. Our next ones will be on fisheries in collaboration with the market and trade division in FAO Equator, as well as the fisheries and aquaculture division. Uh, so we will be announcing the, the themes and dates for the upcoming uh, dialogues in, in the very near future. And we look forward to that level of attendance and that quality of, uh, of dialogue, which was really uh, very impressive today. Uh, from the very beginning to the concluding remark by you, uh, Miss Ennis. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, we look forward to having you again. This is an important topic uh, that we will keep, uh, uh, that we need to keep on our agenda. So thanks again, and have a great rest of the day, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.